One of the little areas of interest that I have is the tactics of the Bolsheviks um, in the revolution of October 1917. And as some people know, I've read quite a bit of Lenin on this. I recently picked up this book um, by Curzio Malaparte called Coup d'etat, The Technique of Revolution. Now, Malaparte was an Italian and um, he accompanied Mussolini on the march to Rome in 1922 and was a close associate of uh, Mussolini and that regime. And he wrote this book um, sometime uh, yeah, in 1931 where he basically went through uh, several different coup d'etats uh, in order to try to put his finger on what some of the common features are. And he starts off the uh, book with this argument between Lenin and Trotsky. Uh, Lenin maintained that the idea of a world revolution couldn't take place because um, in his book, The Infantile Disease of Communism, he outlined four different um, spe specific circumstances that Russia had that Western Europe did not have um, and maintained that the revolution only succeeded in Russia due to those specific circumstances and therefore could not be transferred elsewhere. Trotsky disagreed with that and I'm going to start uh, reading on page 14 here. I'll just read a few pages because I think the exchange and uh, the kind of lessons that they were trying to draw from it are quite interesting. Trotsky said that the communist did not know how to benefit by the lesson of October 1917, which was not a lesson in revolutionary strategy, but in the tactics of an insurrection. This remark of Trotsky's is very important for an understanding of the tactics used in the coup d'etat of October 1917, that is, the technique of the communist coup d'etat. It might be maintained that the tactics of insurrection are a part of revolutionary strategy, and indeed its aim and object. Trotsky's ideas on this point are very definite. We have already seen that he considers the tactics of insurrection as independent of the general condition of the country or of a revolutionary state of affairs favourable to insurrection. The Russia of Kerensky offers no more of a problem than Holland or Switzerland for the practical application of the October tactics of 1917. The four specific circumstances, as defined by Lenin in The Infantile Disease of Communism, that is, the possibility of combining the Bolshevik Revolution with the conclusion of an imperialist war, the chance of benefiting for a short while by a war between two groups of nations who, except for that war, would have been united to fight the Bolshevik Revolution, the ability to sustain a civil war in Russia lasting long enough in relation to the immense size of the country and its poor means of communications, the presence of a democratic middle-class revolutionary movement among the peasants, are characteristic of the Russian situation in 1917, but they are not indispensable to the successful outcome of a communist coup d'etat. If the tactics of a Bolshevik revolution were dependent upon the same circumstances as Lenin's strategy, there would not be a communist peril just now in all the states of Europe. Lenin, in his strategic idea, lacked a sense of reality. He lacked precision and proportion. He thought of strategy in terms of Clausewitz, more as a philosophy than as an art or science. After his death, among his bedside books, a copy of Clausewitz's Concerning War was found, annotated in his own writing, and his marginal notes to Marx's Civil War in France show how well-founded was Trotsky's challenge of his rival strategic genius. It is difficult to see why such important is officially given to Lenin's revolutionary strategy in Russia unless it is for the purposes of belittling Trotsky. The historical part played by Lenin in the revolution makes it unnecessary for him to be considered as a great strategist. On the eve of the October insurrection, Lenin was hopeful and impatient, 
Trotsky's election to the presidency of the Petrograd Soviet and to the Revolutionary Military Committee and the winning over of the Moscow Soviet majority had finally set his mind at rest about the question of a majority in the Soviets, which had been his constant thought since July. All the same, he was still anxious about the Second Soviet Congress, which was due in the last days of October. We need not get a majority, Trotsky said. It will not be the majority that will have to get into power. And Trotsky was not mistaken. It would simply be childish, Lenin agreed, to wait for a definite majority. So you can see that Trotsky and Lenin were both fully elite theory pilled in their thinking uh, around this. He would have liked to rouse the masses against Kerensky's government. He wanted to bury Russia under the proletariat, to give the signal for insurrection to the entire Russian people, to appear at the Soviet Congress and override Dan and Skopelov, the two leaders of the Menshevik minority, and to proclaim the fall of Kerensky's government and the advent of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Insurrectional tactics did not enter into his mind. He thought only in terms of revolutionary strategy. All right, said Trotsky, but first of all, you must take possession of the town, seize the strategic positions and turn out the government. In order to do that, an insurrection must be organised and storming parties trained. Few people are wanted. The masses are of no use. A small company is sufficient. So um, even though they broadly agreed uh, on strategy, Trotsky in his tactics was fully kind of arguing Moscow's law here. You know, the organized 100 will always defeat the disorganized 1000. Uh, and here is Malaparte, he continues. But according to Lenin, the Bolshevik insurrection must never be accused of being a speculation. The insurrection, he said, must not rest on a plot, nor on a party, but on the advanced section of the community. That was the first point. The insurrection must be sustained by the revolutionary impulse of the whole people. That was the second point. The insurrection must break out on the high watermark of the revolutionary tide. And that was the third point. These three part points mark the distinction between Marxism and mere speculation. So you can see that Lenin is thinking like a politician here. He's worried about um, the popular perception. He's worried about being seen as this being a conspiracy. And he's like, well, it's really important for the revolution to be seen as a people's revolution, not just us, um, you know, being an organized minority. But Trotsky, who's thinking much more like a kind of military commander, comes back. He says, very well, said Trotsky, but the whole populace is too cumbersome for an insurrection. There need only be a small company, cold-blooded and violent, well-trained in the tactics of insurrection. So Trotsky's just got his eye on the specific battle. And he's like, listen, we need to get this job done with this very small amount of highly, you know, like a crack squad basically needs to get this done. Lenin admitted, we must hurl all our units into the factories and barracks. There they must stand firm, for there is the crucial spot, the anchor of the revolution. It is there that OK program must be explained and developed into fiery, ardent speech with the challenge, complete acceptance of this program or insurrection. Very good, said Trotsky. But when our program has been accepted by the masses, the insurrection still remains to be organized. We must draw on the factories and barracks for reliable and intrepid adherence. What we need is not the bulk of workers, deserters and fugitives, but shock troops. So even though Lenin has got his eye on like, well, we need to have some sort of popular will behind us for this to work. Krotsky's like, yeah, OK, but we need to get the job done and we're only going to get the job done if our elite are truly elite and our elites are truly um, well trained enough to get this insurrection done is, is the point that Trotsky is making. If we are, want to carry out the revolution as Marxists, 
that is to say as an art, Lenin agreed, we must also, and without a moment's delay, organise the general staff of the insurrectional troops, distribute our forces, launch our loyal regiments against the most salient positions, surround the Alexandra Theatre, occupy the fortress of Peter and Paul, arrest the general staff and the members of the government, attack the uh, cadets and the Cossacks with detachments ready to die to the last man, rather than allow the enemy to penetrate into the centre of the town. We must mobilise the armed workers, call them to the supreme encounter, take over the telephone and telegraph exchanges at the same time, quarter our insurrectional general staff in the telephone exchange and connect it up by the telephone with all the factory regiments and points at which the armed struggle is to be waged. Very good, Trotsky said, but all that is only approximate, Lenin rec recognised, but I am anxious to prove that at this stage we could not remain loyal to Marx without considering revolution as an art. You know the chief rules of this art as Marx laid them down. When applied to the present situation in Russia, these rules imply as swift and sudden a general offensive on Petrograd as possible, attacking both from inside and out, from the workers' district in Finland, from Raval, and from Kronstadt. An offensive which the whole fleet, the concentration of troops greatly superior to the government's forces, which uh, will be 20,000 strong cadets and Cossacks, we must rally our three chief forces, the fleet, the workers and the military units, to take over the telephone and telegraph offices, the stations and the bridges, and to hold them at any cost. We must recruit the most tenacious among our storming parties for detachments, whose duty it will be to occupy all the most important bridges and to take part in every decisive engagement. We must also form gangs of workers armed with rifles and hand grenades who will march on the enemy positions, on the officers' training schools, and on the telegraph and telegraph uh, telephone exchanges and surround them. The triumph of both the Russian and the World Revolution depends on two or three days' struggle. So that was Lenin. That is all quite reasonable, said Trotsky, but it is too complicated. The plan is too vast, and it is a strategy which includes too much territory and too many people. It is not an insurrection any longer. It is a war. In order to take possession of Petrograd, it is needless to take the train in Finland. Those who start from too great a distance often have to stop halfway. An offensive of 20,000 men from Raval or Kronstadt uh, for the purpose of seizing the Alexandra Theatre is rather more than is required. It is more than an assault. As far as strategy is concerned, Marx himself could be outdone by Kornilov. One must concentrate on tactics, move in a small space with a few men, concentrate all efforts on principal objectives, strike hard and straight. Don't think it is so complicated. Dangerous things are always extremely simple. In order to be successful, one must not challenge an unfavourable circumstance, nor trust to a favourable one. Hit your adversary in the stomach, and the blow will be noiseless. Insurrection is a piece of noiseless machinery. Your strategy demands too many favourable circumstances. Insurrection needs nothing. It is self-sufficient. So that was Trotsky saying, Lenin, l l listen, your plan is way too complicated. Too much 4D chess going on. We need to have much smaller, much more achievable, much more targeted, much more ruthless engagement. Your tactics are extremely simple, said Lenin. There is only one rule, succeed. You prefer Napoleon to Kerensky, don't you? And we're back to uh, Malaparte now. The words which I attribute to Lenin were not invented. They are to be found, word for word, in the letters he wrote to the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party in October 1917. Those who are acquainted with all Lenin's writings, and especially with his notes on the insurrectional technique of the December days in Moscow during the revolution of 1905, must be rather surprised to find out how ingenious his ideas about the tactics and technique of an insurrection are on the eve of October 1917. And yet it must not be forgotten 
that he and Trotsky alone, after the failure of the July attempt, did not lose sight of the chief aim of revolutionary strategy, which was the coup d'etat. After some vacillation, in July, the Bolshevik party had only one aim, and it was of a parliamentary nature, to gain a majority in the Soviets. The idea of insurrection, as Lunacharsky said, had become the driving power of all of Lenin's activities. But during his stay in Finland, where he had taken shelter after the July days to avoid falling into the hands of Kerensky, all his activity was concentrated on the preparation of the revolution in theory. So Malaparty saying that Lenin is still, despite his practical focus, he's quite a theory cell, whereas Trotsky seems much more um, practical, let's just say, in his, in his tactical ideas. Um, there seems to be no other explanation for the ingeniousness of his plan to make a military offensive on Petrograd that was to be backed up by the Red Guards within the town. The offensive would have ended in disaster. With Lenin's strategy checkmated, the tactics of an insurrection would have failed, and the Red Guards would have been massacred in the streets of Petrograd. So Malaparty saying that Lenin's plan was terrible and would have failed, and that Trotsky's was much more effective and much better. Because he was compelled to follow the course of events from a distance, Lenin could not grasp the situation in all its details. Nonetheless, he visualised the main trend of the revolution far more clearly than certain members of the Central Committee uh, of the party who objected to an immediate insurrection. It is a crime uh, to wait, he wrote to the Bolshevik committees in Petrograd and Moscow. So I, I'm just going to skip on a bit because uh, he goes into a bit of kind of court politics and stuff that we don't need to get into here. I'll pick up the thread in a few paragraphs where he says, In his letter of October 17, Lenin defended Trotsky's tactics. Trotsky is not playing with the ideas of Blanky, he said. A military conspiracy is a game of that sort only if it is not organised by the political party of a definite class of people, and if the organisers disregard the general political situation and the international situation in particular. There is a great difference between a military conspiracy which is deplorable from every point of view and the art of armed insurrection. Kamenev and Zinoviev might answer... These were two people in the Bolsheviks who didn't want to go along with Trotsky's plan, by the way, which is the bit I skipped. Has Trotsky not constantly been repeating that an insurrection must disregard the political and economic situation of the country? Has he not been constantly stating that a general strike is one of the chief factors in a communist coup d'etat? How can the cooperation of the trade unions and the proclamation of a general strike be relied upon if the trade unions are not with us? and even in the enemy's camp they will strike against us. We do not even negotiate directly with the railway men. In their executive committee there are only two Bolsheviks to 40 members. How can we win without the general help of the trade unions and without the support of a general strike? These objections were serious. Lenin could only meet them with his unshakable decision. But Trotsky smiled. He was calm. Insurrection, he said, is not an art. It is an engine. Technical experts are required to start it, and they alone could stop it. Trotsky's storming party consisted of a thousand workmen, soldiers and sailors. The pick of this company had been recruited from workmen of the Putilov and Weiburg factories, from sailors of the Baltic fleet and soldiers of the Latvian regiments. Under the orders of Antonov Osik, Enko, these Red Guards devoted themselves for 10 days to a whole series of invisible manoeuvres in the very centre of the town. Among the crowd of deserters that thronged the streets in the midst of the chaos that reigned in the government buildings and offices, in the general headquarters, in the post offices, telephone and telegraph exchanges, in the stations, barracks and the head offices of the city's technical services, they practice insurrectional tactics, unarmed and in broad daylight, and their little groups of three or four men passed completely unnoticed. The tactics of invisible manoeuvres and the practice of insurrectional action, which Trotsky demonstrated for the first time during the coup d'etat of October 1917, is now a part of the revolutionary strategy of the Third International. 
the principles which Trotsky applied are all stated and developed in the handbooks of the Comintern in the Chinese University in Moscow. Among the subjects taught there is the tactics of invisible manoeuvres, which Karakan, with Trotsky's experience for guidance, applied so successfully in Shanghai. In the Sun Yat-sen University in Moscow, the Chinese students learn the same principles which the German communist organisers put into practice every Sunday in order to get into training for the tactics of insurrection. They do it in broad daylight, under the very nose of the police and of the sober citizens of Berlin, Dresden and Hamburg. Okay, I think that'll do. Um, the point of going over this, by the way, is to really show you how it really is elite theory all the way down, that even someone as practical as uh, Lenin still had too much of the kind of theory sound about him and was, and was thinking in completely the wrong way. Uh, whereas Trotsky was thinking of these very, very small, dedicated little units of three and four. And really it was this that produced the effect of the October Revolution, not some the kind of full-scale war that Lenin was planning. The full-scale war would have easily been smashed and defeated, but the invisible manoeuvres worked. They didn't only just work in Russia, they worked in China. And, if you ask me, they've worked in the United States and Europe as well since 1945. But that is a topic for another video. Hope you enjoyed this. Um, do buy my courses. I have 25% off at the moment, all this month, with promo code MATE, that is MATE with three A's, and uh, also Profits of Doom, still available to buy, buy it now, and I'll see you later on for Unpopular Opinions.